Good morning, everybody. This is Rabbi from Goldberg with Rabbi Avi Kahan. Interrupting ours and your Chol HaMoed in order to offer a second update on the Silberberg Aguna case. We interrupt our Simchas Yantef, our Moed, and your Chol HaMoed because this is such a critical, critical issue. And unfortunately, there are misconceptions, lies, distortions, manipulations that are being spread and shared. And we feel an achrais, we feel an obligation and responsibility to clear the record and as well to offer some insight, to take advantage of the opportunity to learn over this Cholamoid with a real expert, Rabbi Kahan, a great Dayan, somebody who's been very, very involved and a lot of experience in Dine Torah, in Beisden, and as a Rav, to help us understand the system as a whole. So I want to offer a very quick update on where we are, and then a conversation with Rav Kahan about the system as a whole, so that all, particularly those who've never had experience with it, can have a better understanding. Again, Rav Kahan is my dear friend, the Rav of Kyle New City, uh, Adayin, the founder of the Beisden Vad Hadin Vahora, and uh, we're so grateful and honored, Rav Khan, that you are joining us yet again. So despite rumors that the get was given in the Silverberg case, it has absolutely not been given. And despite rumors that the Seirav has been lifted against Aaron Silverberg, that is also a fallacy. It's also entirely incorrect and untrue. Your pressure, the efforts of those who attended the rallies, did have an impact. It brought Aaron to the table, and it brought on to a conversation and negotiation that for two years there's been an effort to mediate. For two years there's been an effort to bring him to Beisden and to bring him with various mediators, Rabbanim and lay people that never came to fruition. But because of you, those who placed pressure and those who sp- shined a spotlight online and social media and who showed up and raised your voice in person for the first time, it brought Aaron to a conversation. Aaron came to the Machon Lahora Beisden and uh, signed a Shtarberin, signed a binding arbitration that he was willing to undergo a negotiation. Unfortunately, the person representing Aaron, his Toain, uh, spoke to the head of the Machon Lora Beisden, misrepresented some things, and the Machon Lora put out a letter that you may have seen, because Aaron's side has been sharing it, that declared that the Seirav has been lifted, that the Seirav has been removed because of Aaron's now new willingness to participate. However, the Machon Lora has clarified that that was a mistake but unfortunately they were misled and they've issued and are issuing a new letter. I was part of a conference call on the first day of Cholamoid yesterday morning with the uh, head of the secretary of the Machon Lora Beisden, together with the Menahal of the Beisden of America and the others. And they issued the following text, which will appear on their letterhead immediately after Yontif. Havaras Advarm, they want to clarify. I'm reading to you now from the Machon Lora Beisden. Odos HaMechtav Shiyatza Tachas Yadenu, regarding the letter that came out uh, from us, Be'inyan, regarding Adinu Dvorim Ben Aaron Zilberberg Ben Isha Mars Dvora Lebeis Kunzlinger, regarding the matter between Aaron Zilberberg and Dvora. Kavana Samechtav Ha'isarak La'ashir Shabal Chasam Biyomei Lechodesh Nisan Tavshin Pei Aleph Ashtar Biretz Leinu. All we wanted to do is say that Aaron has signed a binding arbitration that he was willing to engage our base in. Kol Ashar Ha'nechtav Sham Haya Betaus. Everything else written there was done so mistakenly. Because we don't have knowledge about the rest of the dispute about this conflict. So therefore, the letter should not be used to say anything other than the fact that Aaron is willing to go to Beisden. And we call on both sides to pursue the matter with peace, with honor, and to both satisfaction. And critically, they conclude the letter that it should be concluded in a Beisden, which is acceptable to both sides. So again, no get has been given. No binding arbitration has been agreed to by both sides because there is a dispute how the binding arbitration should work, what the terms are to agree. So the Seirav remains in place. The Beisden of America has confirmed the Seirav remains in place. Machol Lahora has confirmed that the Seirav remains in place. Aaron is Masarev Ladin. He has not participated in a Beisden process regarding the giving of the get. And because of that, we need to continue the pressure, your pressure, the shot, spotlight of social media, free Devora. One has to continue. All of us have to continue. We not only have a heter, arguably we have a chiv. We have an obligation and a responsibility. There's a man with a seir of against him who refuses to cooperate in giving his wife a get, and we must continue to apply the pressure. There are conversations and there are negotiations and there's the possibility of mediation. And all of it, please God, will continue and will continue to success. But what brought us to this point has been the pressure and that social pressure must continue. Aaron is currently in Lakewood for Yonta for Pesach. There will be a rally 
outside where Aaron is staying for Yontif, where the details will be shortly coming. But we call on all those who can attend the rally very soon uh, in Lakewood to continue to apply the pressure on Aaron to participate and to do the right thing. Devora deserves it. Family deserves it. She deserves to move on. And we call upon everyone. So again, the get has not been given. Binding arbitration, Star Biren, has not been signed by both sides. They have not decided on a venue or a place for a hearing. It's, in this, it's all uh, untruths that have been told. Um, she is not yet satisfied with the terms, although, please God, they can be uh, they can be worked out. And most importantly, the Seirev against Aaron remains in place, confirmed by both the Beisden of America, who issued the Seirev, and by Machon Lahara Beisden as well. So, Rav Khan, we turn to you. What does it mean? How does a Seirev get placed against somebody? And how is a Seirev removed? And what are Star Beirin? And if the fact that one side has signed them, does that mean that now they've turned the tables and the other is the guilty party? So good night, Rabbi Goldberg. Those are all great questions. And let's see how much time we have. Um, we'll start from what a star boris is. A star boris in English is an arbitration agreement, which means that under the laws of most states in the United States of America, two parties are allowed to decide to have an alt- alternative dispute resolution, meaning that they have a dispute. They don't want to go to court to take care of it. They're allowed to hire a third party person, agree that this star- third party person could take over whatever a judge could preside on. Of course, there are different caveats in every state what, arbit- what the law of arbitration governs, what you're allowed to t- what types of dispute you're allowed to take to arbitration. But it's a general rule. Most disputes you're allowed to take to arbitration, you have to sign. So Baruch Hashem, we live in America. America has such laws. And therefore, Bezdin is allowed to exist nowadays because people are allowed to sign that they're going to follow whatever Bezdin says. And that's what the, what the terminology Stabler is an arbitration agreement means. Um, I think it's important to understand why we're in halacha does it come in. That means there are those that believe, I've seen this very often written, I've seen this posted on certain blogs, that star buyers are meant for liars. That means people are coming in front of Bezdin. Bezdin has to make sure that they're not wasting their time and going to hear for a few weeks to hold in terror and then make a ruling and everyone's just going to walk away not listening. So Bezdin, because they're scared that people are lying and people are not going to keep what they say, they force people to sign a document which is going to make them keep what Bezdin rules. Um, the place can seem to believe not like that. They believe that Shtar is something mandated from the Torah. And the Arachayim HaKadosh in Parsha Shaftim, he discusses this when he, when he brings a Mechilta, that the Mechilta says in the Pasuk, Shaftim B'Shaitim, Titin L'cha B'chal Sharecha. Everyone should have Shaftim, judges, which is Bezdin, and Shaitim, and enforcers. So it could be in the times of the Torah, enforcers were actual policemen. Every Bezdin had people who would enforce, go into people's houses and remove possessions based on Bezdin's Psaq. But the Rechaim HaKadosh says that if you don't have Shaitrim, if you don't have any way to enforce the Psaq, you don't have Shaitrim. Bezin doesn't exist. There's no mitzvah to keep Bezin. There's no mitzvah to go to Bezin if you can't enforce. And many places can quote this Rechaim HaKadosh, and they say, therefore, if Bezin cannot enforce, Bezin doesn't exist. Even if both people promise they're going to keep what Bezin says. Bezin does not exist if they cannot enforce. And Baruch Hashem, we live in a Medina Shal Chesed that has arbitration laws. So Bezin adapted arbitration laws. And said that people should sign, and that gives us shaitrim. But without shaitrim, bezin bezin doesn't exist. Even if we believe everyone's going to keep what bezin's going to say, and I think so that's very very important. So, uh, absolutely. The, so the fact that a bezin is essentially functioning as a civil binding arbitration, and just like you can choose a secular arbitrator, the parties can choose bezin as the binding arbitration, and then they're bound by civil law to follow through on what the bezin says. So explain to us the process of hasbanas. So Devora went to the Basin of America and she said, I'd like a din Torah with my husband to, for him to have to give a get. We're civilly divorced. The civil divorce is final and concluded. We're living separate and apart. We have irreconcilable differences and he refuses to give a get. They met with a Masader Gittin in South Florida and he refused to give the get and they attempted other efforts and he refused to give the get. So she went to the Basin of America and the Basin of America sent three Azmanas, three subpoenas or invitations to participate in Basin to explain his side of the story, why he doesn't think he has to give the get. He ignored all three. And they therefore consider it to be Masari Vildin, they applied a Siriv against them. Could you explain what is a Siriv and what are the consequences of the fact that they applied the Siriv? And then how does the Siriv get uplifted? If he went to an altogether different Beisdin now and he signed binding arbitration with a different Beisdin w- without even responding to the original Beisdin that placed the Siriv, is there even a Havamina? Why would anyone think that would remove the Siriv? So <laughs> these are such great topics, but before we jump into that topic, I want to, I think, I think it's important to start with another question. It's going to help us understand the topic of Azimonis and Syrups is why altogether go to a Bezin for a get? 
It means, what did, what did Devorah want? When she went to the Besan, she said, please invite, send the Hasmana, please invite Aaron to come to the Besan, because that's the English type of a, a, a definition of a Hasmana. Um, what was she asking? What did she want to hear? What was, it was just an appointment for a get? What was, what was the Hasmana being sent out? What did Aaron think he was receiving? So there is a machlik if you need to go to Besan for a get. The mission in the beginning of Sanhedrin says that Gitin is Bishlesha, that when you sit over Gitin, you should have three people. Many of the Rishonim and the majority of the Achreinim believe that that's only a discussion when a husband doesn't want to give a get or a wife doesn't want to take a get. It means a regular get, you don't need three people. We actually do it. It's a Chumrah. We usually have a Bezin when we do a get. Um, but the Mishnah, when the Mishnah was referencing that three people should sit by a get, that's a get that's being done against somebody's will. The Beis Alevi even Beis Alevi says a Chiddush that any time you do something against somebody else's will, the Bezin has to be the one who decides that that could be done. And it's it's very, very important. So therefore, either if we're forcing a man to give a get or we're forcing a lady to receive a get, basically, lady says the same thing. If you want to force a lady to take a get, you need a bezin to make that decision. And bezin has to be the one who decides that. So if a couple consensually just wants to get divorced, the husband and wife can meet at a bezin, do a get. They're usually the ones who do the get. When they want to have a discussion, when one party doesn't want to give a get, then they need to do it in front of the bezin. Now, I think this is very, very important to note. Why in the world should a husband not want to give a get? Why is there ever in Chazal's eyes a dintaira, a purpose to have a dintaira, to discuss? And I think the answer is very simple, even though it's not discussed in the Gemara explicitly, but it's hinted. There were certain husbands who loved their wives. And I think it's very, very natural. Chazal understood that, that there's certain times that the marriage is going to be that the husband leaves the marriage. They institute a ksuba for that reason. The Mishnah says, Kadesh shalote kalabain of lagarsha. It shouldn't be easy for for a man to give his wife a divorce. So they said they have to pick Suba. Ramesh is of the opinion that you might not have to pick Suba now that there's a Chirim Rabbeinu Gershom. That's a Chirim to divorce your wife, Balkar Chuk. You're not let it force her. So you might not have to pick Suba. Ramesh brings that in, 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 in the, through the thought process. But there are certain cases where the, wives leave, where the wife leaves the marriage, which I think is important to discuss. And certain husbands want to still pursue and work on their marriage. That's one reason that a husband doesn't want to give a gap. Another reason is because he wants to negotiate which I, I want to discuss that for two, three minutes, and then we'll get back to the first one. Uh, there is a Chuvis Marash Dam that even though the Rashba argues on it, Rabbi Yash was a of Rachel, who was known to be one of the leaders in Eretz Yisrael, in Evan Ezer, and in Gitin specifically, he sat on the Bezin Rabbanut, and a lot of the protocols that the Bezin Rabbanut uses till this day is based on Rabbi Yash's Psalkim. Rabbi Yash quoted this, this Marash Dam very often in Psalkim, that the Marash Dam says that if somebody wants to make a Tanai before he gives the get, for example, he's one of those people you're allowed to force to give a get. Whatever that means, we'll explain that. He, he's one of the people you're allowed to force, and they're about to beat him up. And right before they beat him up to give the get, he says, look, I want to give the get. I just want her to do A, B, and C first. The Marashadam doesn't really go into detail what A, B, and C is, but I wanted to do an A, B, and C first. The Marashadam Paskins, that if A, B, and C is normal, which again is very debatable what normal means, but if what he's asking is normal, you're not allowed to force him to give the get, even if he's one of those people you're allowed to force. And if you force him to give a get before she does this A, B, and C, the get's not a good get. So now we have in the, we have two precedents in halacha not to give a get. One, when the husband still wants to stay married, he's pursuing, he's running after Shalom Ba'is, he's speaking to everybody. And two, the marashdam, which is debatable what the marashdam means, and we'll speak about it later, um, that he wants to, he wants her to do something before he gives the get. Those are the two, two cases where, so therefore we go to Besden, A, to see, is this marriage still pursuable? Is this still attainable? Does this have any Havamina still working out? And we'll discuss how Besden makes that decision. And Bez, if the husband says, I want to give a get, I just want to see my children. I want to give the get. I just want to settle the ksuba first. I want to give the get. I want to discuss the properties. Are those considered normal to do before you give a get? Those are the two discussions that are brought down in the place game. And I think every dintaira in Eretz Yisrael that happens over Gitin is this discussion. The so husband or the wife says, yeah. Can I interrupt you? So go back to reason number one. So, and let's apply it to our real case that we're with right now. When a couple has, where they're living separately, and a civil divorce is in place. So you can't claim you're going to continue to pursue shalom bias. You're not going to go for counseling. You are civilly divorced. The wife says, absolutely not, based on his pattern of behavior, based on his character, based on our experiences, there is no future. I do not and refuse to be married to this man. So we're living separately. We've divided our lives. We have a civil divorce in place. And you are, you, the husband, are doing certain things in your lifestyle, which make it clear as well that you've moved on that you no longer have a loyalty or fidelity, you've moved on. 
So is, is there even a deal and is there even a, a discussion that needs to take place to happen? In other words, once the wife says there is no possibility of shalom bias, what's left for the based in to evaluate, to determine if they could have shalom bias? Are they going to try to convince her? Are they going to try to coerce her? Are they going to tell her, too bad, you have to wait a little bit longer? I mean, if the wife says, I'm out, I'm done, there's no marriage here, and it takes two to tango, can a based in have her interests more in mind than she has for herself? Or can a based in force her to try to pursue a shalom bias that she knows doesn't exist? What's even left to hear in such a case? So this question is probably the hottest question of the season, I think, that everyone's discussing. What does Bezin have to do Bechal with discussing shalom bias? And I think it's such an important topic. And if, I, if, I, if we could discuss this topic for a couple of minutes, I think we'll shed a light a lot, a lot on the situation. The Mishnah discusses two different personalities of people that we obligate to give a get. One, the Mishnah says, lahitzi. These are the people we force to give a get. And the Mishnah lists off different works that people do, different personalities, the way people act. And the Mishnah, Kedarka Bakadish, is very, very cryptic. It doesn't discuss a lot. The Gemara discusses more. And then the Rishenim, until the modern day, Achreinim, discuss even more different personalities. So, for example, addiction might have not existed in the times of Chazal. We don't even find them discuss so much the brain, you know, or mental illness. I think the brain is referenced once in the whole Shas. A Gemara in Yevamis, where somebody says a Chiddush, and the, the opposing Amoyer says, It appears to me you don't have a brain in your skull. But the brain is not really mentioned. Now we know a lot about mental illness. We have to try to understand how Chazal would understand mental illness. And they discuss all these people that you're allowed to force to give a gift. So the Rambam asks a contradiction. The Mishnah says, and the Gemara says clearly, that a get has to be given consensually. The husband has to want to give over the get. If he doesn't want to give over the get, then the get is actually not a get. What creates a get for being a get and not being just a piece of paper? The get is created by the husband's want to write this get. That means it's very interesting, and I don't want to go too much of a tangent in Hilchas Gittin, but there's a fascinating Pirkei de Belezer that I think is, is worthwhile to be known. The Pirkei de Belezer says there are six people who scream so loudly during something in this world that their voice goes from one side of the world to the other side of the world, but nobody could hear it except the Kaddish Baruch Hu. That's how loud it is. One of them is a lady when she gives birth. One of them is a snake when he crawls between two rocks to shed his skin. There's a, a cold that goes out, says the Pirkei de Belezer, so loud. And one is a lady when she receives her get. The Pirkei Blas says when a lady receives her get, there's some scream. I, I've seen a lot of get and I've never heard screaming. I've seen crying. But there's a scream that only HaKadosh Baruch Hu could hear. And the Achreinim asked on the Pirkei Blas, what about the guy? He's also giving a get. I've seen many guys during get and they're, they're just as emotional as the wives. Sometimes even more emotional. It's very interesting to realize. Sometimes even more emotional. Where is their cry? HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't listen to them. And the explanation that Allah gives is based on a very interesting Rabbaruch Bar. Rabbaruch Bar in his, in his Sefer Birch Shmuel on Gitten brings a Hashkaf at least nine times in his Sefer from his Rabbi Reb Chaim. He brings it down for Abbas Alan Meltzer, for Bolchan Wasman, from himself sometimes. Um, a certain Chiddush, which is very important. And the way he brings down the Chiddush is by asking a contradiction. The halacha is that whenever you make a messenger to do anything, the messenger has to be obligated or have access to the same thing you could. So, for example, someone wants a messenger to build his sukkah for him. He might have to be a year to build a sukkah according to some Rishayim. You want a messenger to be Makadish a lady, to send a shliach to be Makadish a lady, it has to be a yid. The wife wants to send a messenger to accept a get for her, it has to be a yid. The Rimagash says when the husband sends a messenger, he's allowed to send an evid. He's allowed to send an evid to be Megarish's wife, to give a divorce to his wife. And Rabbi Baruch Bar asked that by Kedushin, nowhere it says that you're allowed to send an Evet to be Makadish your wife, or she's allowed to send the Evet to receive the Kedushin. How come by Gitin the man is allowed to send the Evet, but the lady cannot send the Evet to receive it? And Rabbi Baruch Bar says a fascinating Kedush. He says, it's a big mistake to think that the husband is divorcing his wife. A husband doesn't divorce his wife at all. A husband marries his wife. He doesn't divorce her. The Get divorces his wife. The husband just has to provide it for her. The Get, the divorce is happening through the Get being received by the lady. Therefore, the husband's not divorcing the wife, so he could send an evit to bring her over the get. Because the get, the gerishin, the separation, the closure is happening with the get and the acceptance of it. The giving it is just to create the lashma, just to create the actual get. Without the husband's consent, you can't create a get. So a husband doesn't lose as much as the wife's losing by a get. The wife's getting divorced. The Benish Chai says the husband's still married to the wife after the divorce. 
There's a passing the Besarcha al Salim that a husband has to support his Grusha, his wife who's divorced. I mean, for the husband, she's still, they're still married after. The husband's now allowed to marry a second wife. La Halochi, allowed to marry a second wife. Now the husband has two wives. One wife who he's not married to and one wife who he is married to. The wife gets fully divorced. She's allowed to go marry somebody else. The divorce is happening to the wife, not to the husband, which I think is very, very important to understand. And that's why there's only a cull that leaves from the ladies, from, from the lady's mouth. And therefore, the Rambam asks a question. If the creation of the get happens because the husband has lishma and the husband is giving his consent, how are you ever allowed to force a husband to give a get? Which is, I think, a great question because on social media, people are writing, if you force the get, it's not a good get. Some people are writing, if you force it is, and people are quoting different sources. So the Rambam explains beautifully. And the Rambam, whatever his proof is, it's very debatable what the Rambam's proof is. But the Rambam says that he knows that every yid, deep down, is a good person. Every yid wants to be a good person. It's a Gemara in Brochus. The Gemara says that um, Rabbi Alexander used to say before, after he finished davening, that Hashem, you know that every yid wants to do the right thing. Who's stopping us? Rashi says the Yed Sahara. Every yid, the Rambam says, we know every yid wants to do the right thing. And every yid subconscious, which is their neshama, was created with the Torah. And therefore, if the Torah says that he's forced to give a get, means he deep down wants to give a get. He just is not mindful enough to his feelings. And he has some type, says the Ram, some type of personality disorder, which is telling him that it's okay not to give his wife a gut. Even if he's saying he wants shalom bias. And therefore, such a person, the Ramam says, you're allowed to beat him till you get through to him. You're allowed to give him musr. You're allowed to talk to him. You're allowed to protest. You're allowed to beat him till you get through. Because we know deep down he wants to do it. And he has a personality disorder. It's very interesting. The, the Ramam doesn't say this, but the Gemara. And Brachas, when the Gemara says Mima Akiv, the Gemara says it's two things, Seir Shebi Isa, which is the Eight Sahara Rashi says, and Shibud Malchias, Gullus. The Rambam doesn't quote that Gullus is what creates this decision not to give the get, but it seems like that's what the Gemara says also. So people have a lot of reasons why not to give the get. They have a personality disorder, Yet Sahara, bad advice, but it's not really them. We don't have a Havamino that any person who's not giving the get deep down is bad. Because if we would have such a Havamino, then we wouldn't be able to ask the person to give a get. We have to, to believe it. That's why the way. Practical. To bring it back to the practical for a second. So, therefore, the rallies, the protests, the social media momentum, all of it is not, if Aaron chooses or if someone were to choose to give a get as a result of that, doesn't turn it into a get Musa. It's not a course to force get, which would invalidate it. It is the world. In other words, don't protest against Aaron because you dislike him. Protest because you love him and because you want to get him to do what he knows he really wants to do. This is such an important, important idea. Because there's those who've been saying, I can't do that to a fellow Jew. We're embarrassing. We're humiliating. We're shaming him, his family. I, I can't do that. And the answer is that's hate. It's hate. It's hate to not protest. Because to protest, to rally, is to speak to the Pintaliyid, the neshama inside the person and say, we know what you really want to do more than you know. And we're going to try to remove the barriers and peel back the layers and get to the core of who you are, which is someone who wants to do the right thing. So I want to go back to just another practical. Can I, can I, can I interrupt one second? Yeah, please. I, I just I, I want to bring it to a close because I think people are going to be very critical to this point. This is where the Beis Alevi learns up from the Gemara that Bezin makes this decision. Because who gets to decide of who's Elu Shekhaif and Lahaitzi? And this is where I want to discuss why do we need Bezin for this at all? Who The, the Mishnah lists off who's Elu Shekhaif and Lahaitzi, which means who has a personality disorder that deep down they want to give a get and they think, they actually think that they don't want to give it. And who's that person that you have to get through? And who's that person you're allowed to scream? And also, I think a question that we have to ask is, since when does the Torah say screaming helps? Like, why is that the hashkafa? Why, why is that what the Rambam says? Force him, hit him. Like, shouldn't we talk to him? Shouldn't we have a conversation with him first? I think that's very, very important to, to address why we jump to protest. Why, don't, why they're not things that are done first. Are the things that are done first and we should explain. But here's where the base of Libby says that Bezin has to be the one to make that decision. And there's a machlikis why, and this is very, very important. There are those that say, and this is, I think, so important for the for, for the Hamoyin Am to understand. There's another Mishnah that discusses people who you're not allowed to force to give a get, but they're obligated to give a get. Elu shechayim legarish, elu shechayim lehoitzi. These are the people that are obligated to give a get. And the Rishonim, among them Rabbeinu Tam, ask a question. Many Rishonim ask this question. Deep down, what does this guy want? Does he want to give a get or does he want to not give a get? Because the Rishonim clearly say that somebody who's chayiv to give a get and you beat him, the get's not a good get. Chaim, you're allowed to incentivize him. Says Rabbeinu Tam, you're allowed to tell him not to come to shul. You're allowed to say you're not going to give him a lead. You're allowed to actually protest. You don't bury 
It could be in certain cases you don't bury their craving, you don't mal their children. Many not many machlokes. What do you do when somebody reaches the level chayiv? But the rishonim asks deep down, who is this person? If he wants to give a get, let's beat him. If he doesn't want to give a get, don't. And the rishonim say something beautiful. It's a true sarash. Rabbi Natan, many rishonim are mashma like this. The rishonim say there are certain people. Let's say this guy's not giving a get because he actually loves his wife. And it's, it's horrific. I've sat at many, many, many such meetings. And we have to be very, very sensitive to it. A guy comes in and he did something wrong. And it could be the reason he was capable of doing something wrong is because he already has a personality disorder. He already thinks it was okay for him to do something wrong. I mean, the Balatanya, many Svar, Rabbi Goldberg, we know this, say that a Yid could only do something wrong when they make a mistake and they think they're capable to do something wrong. So this guy is there. He's doing these things wrong. And now he comes and he says, I want to do tshuva. I mean, Rabbi Goldberg, we would accept such a person into the room. We would say, come on, let's talk to us. Let's do tshuva. And here we're telling him, no, your wife doesn't have to accept you back. So says Rabbi Tam and the Rush and many other Rishayim, such a person, you're allowed to tell him, look, you're a tzaddik. You're a good person. But you did something wrong. We want us to be with you to do tshuva, but she's not obligated to stay with you. She's not. She's not. She's allowed to decide. We're not Christians. The Catholic Church doesn't believe in divorce. The Barbanel says the reason why we believe in divorce fall apart if I do something wrong then I, I can't strengthen my marriage that Barbara Nell says and that's where he argues with the Catholic Church so we tell this husband we're sorry you could do true but you could start your life again you can marry somebody else but she's not obligated she's not obligated but somebody who's chayiv you're not allowed to force him to give a get you have to get him to understand this you have to talk to him you have to talk to him you have to say I'm sorry you have to get, you have to get we have to get through to such a person we have to break through to such a person you're allowed to push him you're allowed to say i'm sorry until you don't understand this you can't come to shul i'm sorry until you don't understand this we can't give you an aliyah i'm sorry until you don't understand this. we're going to protest in front of you until you come to the table but you're allowed to get through to him Kaifin, you're not getting through to that person chazal are telling us you're not going to get through to that person he hit a level he hit a level that you're probably not going to be able to get through to him He's, he has a real deep personality disorder. I mean, we, the psychologists now understand what the Rambam meant a thousand years ago. The Rambam says somebody with a personality disorder, a deep one, where his Yetzirah is fully governing him, he doesn't even recognize himself, you're allowed to beat him. Because you're not going to get through to such a person. Modern day psychologists say that people who have narcissistic personality disorders, which is L'chair, the Yetzirah, it's the Sar Shabi Esau, you can't get through. You can't talk to them. So the Rambam says, Kaifin, Kaifin. It's not that the Torah likes this. It's not that the Torah is a fan of this. So you don't have a choice. Just, for, for both of our liability sake, let's just clarify. We don't beat anyone. We don't cattle prod anybody. <laughs> we, don't, we don't get physical or graphic or violent with anyone today. What we talk about today forcing is the harchakas that have been a time, like we're talking about right now, the social pressure and uh, shining the spotlight and um, uh, withdrawing from a person socially, not allowing them to have certain social licenses or privileges, membership in community, kibudim, and so on and so forth. That's our version of, of forcing today. Rabbi Khan, did you have conversations with Aaron directly? Were you involved in trying to mediate and in trying to bring this to a, a, a get without having to go to a basin, without having to have a hearing, to just realize that the, the marriage is over, give the get, it's the final step towards this separation. And do you think that we've reached the point that you just described of Kofin, that while Aaron is a wonderful person inside and, and externally too, in many, many, many ways, but there's a Yitzhahar that has gotten the best of him that he's refusing to cooperate until now in giving us the, the license and the permission to be doing these social pressure. So it's, it's, I, I, wanna, I, wanna, I wanna talk about this because it's so important. There's a safer called Kfiyah Beget, which a lot of the Dayanim use. It's one of the essential swarm that Dayanim use when they navigate through these complicated topics because these complicated are, are, these topics are very complicated. The safer Kfiyah Beget was written by Rabbi Tzvi Gardner and in Tufshin Mem Aleph, a couple of years ago, um, Rabbi Yashiv gave a haskama to the Sefer. And in the haskama to the Sefer, you could buy it in the store, Rabbi Yashiv wrote, what do you do when, one, when the parties don't want to go to Bezdin? In such a case of Kriya. And Rabbi Yashiv wrote a psak that's so fascinating. Rabbi Yashiv wrote that when a lady comes to Bezdin just for a get, for nothing else, she doesn't want her ksuba, she doesn't want mumminess, she's just coming for her get, just coming for her get. That is a dinter between her and Hashem. Rabbi Yashiv brings a raya when an aguna comes to Bezdin and says, Mace Baili, I don't know where my husband is. And the Gemara has a discussion. Is this a dintaira between her and her husband? Because she's going to be taking ksuba from her husband's property anymore. And she's also now going to get remarried. Do we look at it as a dina moment, as a dintaira, and we can't pass it until the husband shows up? Which is, is a contradiction to the concept of an aguna. Or no, do we say we could, we'll accept it in turn. And the Gemara says, no, it's a dina nefashis. We, we could accept, the husband's not a party over here. Rabbi Yashiv says, in a case where a husband's in Sarev, lovely Ladin, so you ask them to come forward. You ask them to come forward, and he says, not, you're allowed to pass in Shalei B'fnei Baila. 
without her husband being there. And this has been discussed many times in the Paiskim. There are numerous chubas about this topic. Ritzi Ben Yaakov from the Rabbanut in Tel Aviv wrote about this, a 40-page chuba about this, explaining this to Rabbi Yashiv. Many Paiskim wrote about this. Rabbi Yashiv ended off with a Maram Shik, that the Maram Shik says you still have to try your best to speak to the husband, also to hear both sides, just for transparency reasons. So when Devorah calls a Rav, she's asking for the Rav, Paskin, without my husband being there. The Rav's not allowed to even listen to her story without trying to reach out to the other Rav, because the Gemara says that's mid vashakatir they're one side without the other. We reached out, we spoke to Aaron. He's, he's, he's a great person, he's a good person. Aaron's a good person who has a lot of trauma, and we just need to get through to him. We spent hours, he has a lot, a lot of complaints, a lot of kindness against the world, and against specifically this case. We're not going to get into too much detail, and we have to push him. We have to push him to give the get. But I could say, from being involved, from speaking to Aaron and speaking to Vora, that I believe Aaron is the person that deep down wants to give a get. Now, of course, we have to push him to go to Bezdin, and Baruch Hashem, the protest made a move that way, that he's willing to go to Bezdin. Of course, he signed with a lot of conditions that he's willing to go to Bezdin, which a person doesn't have the right to do. You have conditions, we discussed this in Marashdam, which we're not even getting into detail, conditions to discuss when the get should be given, but the conditions to go to Bezdin, you don't have the right to do. Bezdin of America wrote a serif, which gave them the permission to make up sack without him being there. Um, now in the in the eleventh hour, he's saying he wants to go to Bezdin, which is a little bit not fair. They're already separated for a long enough time that Ramosha Feinstein, Rabbeinu Yeruchim, Reb Chaim Palaji, and many of the Gedolei Poiskim, and including Ramosha Feinstein, says after a certain amount of separation, we don't push on bias anymore. We don't. It's very sad. I have men who call me and tell me, "I'm telling you, my wife's going to come back." I'm tell- they promised me. They cry in my office. I want to cry with them. I'm I'm just as sad as they are. Seven, eight years, I have somebody now, 11 years, I wish he's listening to this message, 11 years is telling me that he promises me his wife's coming back. He doesn't understand he has such a narcissistic personality disorder. He doesn't understand. And he always screams at me, how come you're not pushing the same way you're pushing me to give again? How come you're not pushing your for shalom bias? And I say, because Ramesh has a chuba among any, many good daily places that after a certain amount of time, even if the husband is a perfect person, we force him to give again. Because she's not coming back. And if she's not coming back, you're being mevatel yuchi of ksuba, of spending time with your wife, of not supporting her properly. And she's allowed to move on. You're holding her back from getting remarried. You're and you're allowed to force this person you're stealing to their dignity. You're stealing their dignity because they're entitled to say that I don't want to continue to be married to you. And as badly or as much as you claim to be in love with me, it takes two, it takes two parties and, and I'm moving on. So why can't Dvorah or some of the other circumstances that are going on right now that people know and everyone should continue their efforts to free these women who finally – no longer feel so isolated and alone. And even if those who have not yet received their get, at least what they've received is the support of the community, the visibility, the empathy, which all goes an enormous, enormous way as well. So why can't Dvorah or these other women say, I refuse to go to a base, then I'm not talking about arbitration, just give the get. There's nothing to hear. We're civilly divorced. We're fully separated according to Moshe for that length of time that it's irreconcilable that we're not getting back together. So I'm not going to participate in Bezdin. I was willing to do that two years ago, a year ago, six months ago. But now we're at a point, give the get. There's nothing more to talk about. Can we be rallying and pushing and showing up and saying, there are no conditions, there's no negotiation, there's no longer room for Bezdin to decide whether a get should be given. It's black and white, it's obvious. You've moved on with your life. Your lifestyle, the way you're conducting your life, you clearly are not acting as somebody who sees himself as still married. So therefore, give the get. Why, why does why does she need to agree to go to Bezdin altogether? She does. It's a good question. She doesn't need to agree to go to Bezdin. The way Bezdin's created in America is any Rav who decides that he wants to have a Bezdin is allowed to make is allowed to say he has a Bezdin. That's clear in halacha. It used to be, and Rabbi Ashim still held very strongly in that even in America it used to be. You need something called Zion Tuve year. The members of a community, they ran the community. They need to have a certain type of leadership, which we almost don't have in most communities. They appoint the best. And nowadays, any rough could become a best. Then. A lady has to go to a rough and she has to say, hi, I want, I want to tell you a story and I want to leave such a marriage. Now, why does she have to speak to a rough? The rough, it's not any lady's allowed to leave a marriage whenever she wants. If a lady doesn't have an excuse from her commitment that she gave her husband that she's going to stay married and she doesn't have a proper reason why she's leaving, then that halakha, the halakh is that that lady is considered rebellious. What does that mean? A lady who just finds another man in the street and says, you know what? I'm done with my husband. I'd rather be with this guy. And the husband did nothing wrong. He treated the marriage the way he was supposed to treat. And she's the one who's rebelling from the commitment of marriage. The halakh is that the husband doesn't have to support that wife anymore. He doesn't have to support that wife. The halakh is the husband's supposed to give that wife a get because she's going to be with somebody else. And we don't want that. That's a halakh of an ish ish. But the halakh, the halakh is that the husband still let her pursue the marriage. He's allowed to try his best. He's allowed to try to convince her for a certain amount of time. 
After that time is done, we say now you're forced to give a get. It's not going to happen. You guys are not getting back together. That time is supposed to be, Ramos rights is supposed to be given over to a dying. A dying should decide, did you pursue? Is there still any chance? Is this going to work, Bechlal? Now he could do it by looking, talking to the lady. He could do it by meeting them both together. If the couple gives them permission, he's allowed to meet with each party separately. Uh, Rabbi Anderson Eichschitz writes that clearly in Simon Yudzayin. And they're allowed to make any deal to hear the dispute. But in certain cases, the husband says, I'm not willing to talk. I'm not willing to talk to a Rav. So there, in those cases, the Rav gives him an opportunity, a certain amount of time to show up to the table, which is called a Hasmana. The Bezdin or the Rav sends out a Hasmana. If the husband doesn't show up, they say he's a Masarif. He's not coming here. He's not coming here. They're allowed to pass in Shalai Bifana. They're allowed to hear the wife's side and then say the story. It could be they're going to tell the wife, I'm sorry, based on your story, we're still going to allow the husband to pursue Shalom Bayis. I have many cases where ladies come to me, tell me their story, and I say, I understand you want to get divorced. Personally, I'm, I'm sharing with you that I think you're making a mistake, but if your husband comes to me and he says he wants to pursue you and run after you and try to convince you to come back together, I'm going to give him that opportunity. Why not? I think he's. I think he would be doing a stupid move by just giving you up. Right and just moving moving on. But how much time do we allow that? We don't allow that seven years. We don't allow that. Ramosha says more than a year. Rabbi Chaim Palaji says eighteen months. And you have to understand that was eighteen months where they didn't have cell phones, they didn't have phones, they didn't have uh, a WhatsApp, and communication was probably done once every month. And the Rabbi Chaim Palaji allowed eighteen months when they're living in two different cities. The Dayanim have to say how much time is needed. But when the husband doesn't show up, the bezin has to pass without him there. And I think that's very important to become public. But the dinim and rabbanim have to start paskining. Right away. That means they have to call up the husband and say, do you want to show up within six weeks? Do you want to show up within two months? Do you want to show up within three days? Whatever time this dying feels is necessary based on his understanding of Chayshim But If the husband says, yeah, great. Hear both sides. If the husband says, no, hear the wife's side. Rabbi Asher learns up that this is Dini Nefashis. This is not Dini Mamadis. It's very important. Agunas are Dini Nefashis. So it's a very important point you're making because it, it, there are people who oversimplify this in both directions. There are those who say that once a woman, she wakes up one morning, she says, I no longer want to be married to this guy. And if he doesn't give a get by this, that afternoon, she's an aguna. And that's an oversimplification, which is really a, a disservice in one direction. There is halacha. There is a process. He is entitled to a certain amount of time. Um, so in oversimplification, the direction that says any woman who doesn't get her get within five minutes is an aguna and is entitled to the community support, rallies, protests, and he is a villain is an unfair oversimplification in one direction when maybe the husband does deserve a certain amount of time or for the sake of shalom, truth, children, family, there should be some space and some margin to see whether there can be reconciliation. On the other hand, there's the oversimplification in the other direction, which is what we're suffering from a little bit right now, of people who take the sources of Khan that you've been so seamlessly sharing and, and, and manipulating those sources to say almost indefinitely, no, and they, this and that, and this reason and that achron, and Bezdin, and Psak, and Kfia, and therefore he's done nothing wrong, right? You've told me that behind every ma'agin, behind every man not giving a get, is a Rav, a Dayan, or a Bezdin who is protecting him, misquoting sources to support him, or who's contributing to the manipulation of the system, right? Many of these men are not knowledgeable or well versed enough to be able to manipulate the system on their own. Behind every ma'agin, behind every man not giving a get, is a Bezdin or a rabbi or a Dayan who is enabling that person by providing certain sources and oversimplifying in the other direction. And that's why the system really needs credible people with integrity, sensitivity, um, modesty, humility, who are care about all the components and all the variables who will navigate the halacha, the protocols, the common sense, the psychology, and will say, here's enough margin to see whether something can be reconciled but it's also going to be a very short rope because we're not going to let women who deserve to move on with their lives become stuck and paralyzed indefinitely. That's grossly unfair and, and a disservice unjust to them. So the, there are people who conveniently will oversimplify in both directions, but the truth is in a very nuanced way in between, and it needs knowledgeable and credible people. But this is one of those situations where with the nuance, with the time, with the effort, with the countless Attempts at mediation, everything has been tried. So the public, or those who are still listening, need to know that, um, again, the Seirav is still in place, the Basin of America is confirmed, and Machon Lahara is confirmed. Yes, Aaron did sign a binding arbitration with the Basin, but he signed it on his terms, with his conditions, and Dvorah has not agreed to those. That's not the venue that she took him to. She took him to the Basin of America. He and his towing have absolutely ignored and neglected the Basin of America, and instead 
tried to pivot to another base thing by signing a barb- the arbitra- binding arbitration that's very favorable to him with his conditions. And it s- tries to show the world, oh, he's the good guy now. He's cooperating. She's not cooperating. But it's simply not true. She's cooperated. She's asked him to participate. He's thumbed his nose. He said no countless times. And now in the 11 and a half hour, uh, he, he's going to his own Beisden with his own conditions that she decided are unfair. And while there are ongoing conversations and negotiations, very important to say, there are ongoing conversations. Can they find a place where they will both agree how to proceed? But simultaneously, it is critically important to keep the pressure up. So if you're listening, if you're watching, keep that pressure up. Post on social media. There's going to be a rally in Lakewood where Aaron is staying, protesting our own directly. Please stay posted. Please uh, become aware of when that rally will be and show Rebecca, up. Can I interrupt for a second? Yes. What you mentioned before, you know, in the, on the first on the first uh, video chat that we did, I try to stay very very politically correct. Um, after getting a numerous amount of WhatsApps, text messages, and emails, I realized that it doesn't really make a difference. Everybody's going to understand whatever whatever they want to hear and whatever they want to understand in their own way, but. With misunderstanding the halacha, I, I want to say something that, that to me is so interesting, and I want to really call out. Um, there have been many people who have posted videos. I get I get emails and WhatsApp chats from husbands who never are part of groups that deal with parental alienation, which is a whole topic that, that does need to be dealt with, where fathers loyally don't get to see their children in certain cases. It's it's such such a... a, a, a I don't even know what the word is. It's it's terrible. Um, it's still not an excuse, and I, I want to discuss that. But one of the people who they go to who discusses the topic of Gittin actually put out a kuntras. It was written anonymously. I'm not sure who put it out. It's called, um, I think, Pulmas Gitte Hakazim. You could actually find it find it online, which bashes the psukim from the Dayanim and the Rabbanut how they pass in when a husband is forced to give a get and when not. And um, one of the psakim that the Rabbanut uses is a psak from Rabbeinu Yerucham, which we said, where Moshe Feinstein quotes, or Chaim Palaji, many places can quote, that when you're separated for a certain amount of time, and there's no chance of Shalom Bayes, we force the husband to give a get. And they write that nobody paskins like this Rabbeinu Yerucham, and they quote the paskin who disagree with Rabbeinu Yerucham, who say we don't paskin it. And one of the paskin they quote is the Divri Malkiel. In all their contrasts that came out against these gifts, and they quoted Divri Malkiel. And I was very, I wanted to see the different Malkiel inside. I didn't know about it. And the different Malkiel was talking about a case, vice versa. It's where a lady didn't want to accept the get. And the husband said, hey, it's more than a year. And she said, I want closure. I want to understand why this is not working. I want to understand what's being done. And they write on the Chayim Rabbeinu Gershon that the wife deserves closure. And we don't use the Rabbeinu Yeruchim to pressure her to accept the get. These people took that Rabbeinu Yeruchim and they flipped it around. They said, hey, you see the different Malkiel says we don't pass them like Rabbeinu Yeruchim. Yeah. We just explained the wife is the one that needs closure when she's accepting get something's happening to her. She's the one who's who's getting divorced. The husband's not getting divorced. Of course, we might not use her being Yeruchim to force to get upon the wife. But the husband, many places can use their Ben Yeruchim. And I don't want to get into people are going to start sending me emails who doesn't quote their Ben Yeruchim. It's a huge sugya. Rabbi Yasha discusses this topic of Ben Yeruchim in the Chelech Ches of the Piskid in Rabbanot, which is a psak Rabbi Yasha wrote himself. So nobody could say he meant it, he didn't mean it. Everyone should take a look at it. It's on Hebrew books, the Piskid in Rabbanot, Chelech Ches, page 222, where Rabbi Yasha discusses clearly when a marriage is over. It's such an important topic. And yeah, people abuse the topic. I've seen people who are good people. And they'll send me, and they're in pain. They're all in pain. A lot of them, some, some of them haven't seen their children properly the way they would like. Divorce is a very painful thing. We're not, we're not saying it's not. It's extremely painful. But that pain, you have two ways of using it. You have used, you could use that pain to grow from your mistakes and become a better person, or you can use that pain to allow the Yitzhar to govern every one of your emotions. And sometimes the Yitzhar dresses with a beard and a very chashev kapata and a very big up hat, and he has a sign on his door, and he tells people, Mar makaymis and halacha. And it's, it's very, very, very sad because the halacha, the Torah is there, and it makes perfect sense. And when I see people quote certain stuff, I think they think we live in Yemen or, or, or in certain Muslim communities. And I hope this is not, not politically correct to say, but I, I think they think that the Torah has a different relationship of husband and wives. And we, our, our Torah is perfect set. We follow it. But if we corrupt it, it's a Samham of us. If we corrupt it, it's you're a making, poison you're making, you're making that destroy our Ashkafa. You're making such an important point because I myself have received such an education about Toanim and Bate Din and, and certain Askanim over the last uh, six weeks, two months. And there's a lot of corruption, a lot of corruption. And there's a lot of Shalol Shema, and there's a lot of manipulation. 
it's very, very painful to see. But and it's what the Navi, it's what the Navi mourns. I have a greater appreciation of of, of haftorahs over the last six weeks than I ever have. Even the haftorah of Shabbos Agadol, where they they say, and before uh, Tishabov, Lama li rov zivchechem, you're shuckling, you're davening, you're halach. It's all beautiful, but take care of the widow and the orphan. Take care of mishpat and staka. Have justice and righteousness because the corruption is is really unbearably painful to see. I also want to make a comment on the parental alienation that you said, and I want to correct, which with Devorah's permission, would never want to air such a laundry in public, but only because there are lies being told. So there are people who are defending Aaron's behavior saying, he's not allowed to see his children, what do you want him to do? That's all he can do is withhold the get in order to be able to get to see his children. He's not allowed to see his children. First of all, right now, Pesach, he has two of his three children for three weeks. For three weeks, he has two of his three children. They're with him full time, the entire time. There's no alienation. There's no uh, denial. He has his children for three straight weeks, traveled with them. They're with him, A. B, he withheld the get for a significant time, even before there was an order of protection regarding the third child. When it comes to the third child, it's not devoted. There's a judge who put in place an order of protection for whatever circumstances that are there, that please God, reconciliation will take place. Everybody agrees, including Devora that her daughter is better off with the father in his life. She wants Aaron in his life, but in a safe way that everyone's comfortable with healing, with therapy, and with the ability to reconcile. She wants that. Everybody wants that. Please, God, that will happen. But right now, there's an order of protection regarding the third child. But here's the thing. Aaron refused to give the get before there was an ever an order of protection. When custody was split, when he had all the time that he wanted, when he was enjoying all the time that he deserved with his children, he still refused to give the get. So anyone who defends him, anyone who gets behind him and says, he is entitled to use the get as leverage to extort or to exploit or because he wants to get his children back. He's had his children all along with his third child only recently is an order of protection. And please God, it will be reversed and he'll be able to be with that third child as well. But he was withholding the get long before this order of protection ever began. And therefore, clearly it's not connected to the children at all. So it's a very real issue, parental alienation. And it's a horrible thing. Whenever I meet with couples who are getting divorced, which unfortunately is too often, I always say the same line to them. Before we even begin, I say to them, love your children more than you hate one another. You have a choice. Do you love your children more than you dislike the other, or are you going to allow your dislike of the other to supersede the love of your children? Because your children deserve parents who can get along, who can cooperate for their sake. So you have a choice to make. So parental alienation is a terrible, terrible thing. And it's better for children to have their parents most of the time, almost all the time in their lives, except for extreme circumstances. So you're right, deserves to be addressed another time, but this is not a case of it. And nor is this a excuse to not give the get because he wasn't giving the get long before there was this issue with the third child. 100%. And, uh, and again, we're telling, I spend many, I mean, now now Aaron probably looks at me as an enemy. I haven't spoken to him since we, you know, we aired, we aired the video. I spent a lot of time with certain friends of Aaron who really were trying to help him give a get. And then there were certain friends who really weren't trying to help. And I think it's very important. I heard this many times from Ramir Stern, my Rebbe, when I discussed with him, Gitten, and different topics. And he, he sometimes tells me, he says, they, this boy thinks he has friends. Does he realize that any friend who's giving someone advice that's contrary to the Torah, it's not a friend, it's an enemy. They're giving bad advice because they want to maybe stay friends with him. They want him to like him. That's not friends. Aaron, if you're listening to this, I could tell you honestly, me and Robbie Goldberg are your friends. We really, really want you to do the right thing. We really believe that your life will turn out better and will be better by you moving forward. You're going to find another wife. You're going to build a beautiful relationship with your children. You're going to build a nice relationship with your ex-wife. But as an ex-wife, as a wife, you can't get along. It didn't work out. You guys were not able to get along as a husband and wife. And therefore, we know you want to give a get. Just give the get and you'll be able to move on and have, you'll have closure. The voter will have closure. Your children will have closure and you'll build a beautiful family. But a family that's being built on machloikis, on fighting, is not a family. It's not a family. It's not a life. It's the worst thing in the world. Bezdin is supposed to be Bezdin is supposed to be marvel shalom ba'ilam. Tell me the chamar marvel shalom ba'ilam. If you go to Bezdin and you're creating a machlekes, Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar discusses this in Parshas Vayichi that Yaakov Zavinu Yaakov Zavinu bracha to Yisachar was that the Bezdin should create shalom, not machlekes. And if the whole Bezdin system is about machlekes, about fighting, and it looks like we're hearing on social media, then we're making a mistake. We're not bringing Mashiach that way. We believe, and this is what the Rebbeinu Shalom is: it's Goli v'Yadula Fenecha. Hashem knows that's Ritzidin Ulas is Ritzayin Chol. We look in Chazal, Chazal tells us what our inner Ratzin is, our deep Neshama, our personality, our Chilak Elikai is to do the right thing. And in this case, it's to give a gap. 
it's so well said and it's a perfect place to leave it. This was a long video update, but it was really important to understand not only the specifics of this case, but many of the principles and the rules in general for people who are unfamiliar with them, how the system works and why it works. And Rav Khan, we thank you for your expertise and sharing it with us. And I, I can't echo strongly enough everything that you said, which is that neither of us have anything against Aaron. We know Aaron and we love Aaron and we want Aaron to do the right thing. And we'd love to get back to that to that place. And if Aaron claims that there are financial uh, differences and that he deserves different than what the civil court determined, you're entitled to go to Bayesden to do that. Nobody's telling you you're not entitled to pursue what you think are your financial rights in Bayesden. Go and pursue them. And if Devorah were to not cooperate with Bayesden, we'd be the first to be encouraging and pressuring her in that circumstance, in that situation. However, the get cannot be an obstacle. The get cannot be leveraged. It's time. It's time to let her move on and to reap all the benefits and rewards that Rebbe Khan spoke about so beautifully. We want to wish everyone a good moed. We want to wish all agunas that she'd be able to go free on this Chag Geula to experience freedom and redemption and that Taka we're all able to enjoy shalom, that we can enjoy peace and harmony in our families and in our communities. Thank you.